Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of Q by Christina Dolce. So this was released in North America under the title Masterclass. Um, I can't decide which of the two titles I like, I think they're both pretty good. I picked this up from a charity shop, I was super excited to get to it because I really uh, enjoyed reading Vox, which she also wrote. Uh, spoiler alert, I did really enjoy this as well, to the point at which I'm now looking forward to reading the rest of Dolce's books. But as usual, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then we'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So. Dane reads, would you make the grade? It begins as a way to make things fairer, an education system that will benefit everyone. It's all in the name of progress. This is what Eleanor Fairchild believes. As a teacher in one of the government's elite schools for children with high Q scores, she witnesses the advantages firsthand. But when Elena's own daughter scores lower than expected, she is taken away. Elena follows her to her new home, a government institute. What she finds there makes Elena question everything, because this world is about perfection and that comes at a terrible price. And so we learn right from the beginning, uh, it's all written in first person from the point of view of uh, Elena Fairchild. And um, we learn how she thinks about Q scores, how they've just become a part of life, you know? Things haven't been good here for a long time. I almost can't remember how it felt before we all started carrying the Q numbers around with us, like an extra and unnatural print on the tips of our fingers, a badge of honour for some, a mark of shame for others. I suppose after more than a decade you can get used to anything, like cell phones, remember not having the entire universe in your back pocket, remember sitting on the floor talking to your best friend about nothing, unwinding a curly cord only to watch it kink up again, remember all that, I do and I don't. Blockbuster two-day video rentals and bookstores the size of an airplane hangar are distant memories, faded impressions of life before streaming and same-day delivery. And so uh, her daughter Anne is talking about somebody, Jules, in her school who's not doing very, very well. Um, I'll just read this out because I think this gives you quite... Fuck me, made me jump like shit. So I'm just going to read this whole chunk out here um, because I think it tells you a lot about both the Q scores but also about, you know, the youth. Uh, attitude towards them. Anyway, Jules now has the lowest Q in the whole junior class thanks to the calc test, Anne says. And she's had three sick days this term. And she didn't make the bus last Wednesday. And her mum got laid off so the family income's down. It all adds up. Another bite of apple, another swipe of her tablet. If she doesn't score some serious points, she'll be on the green bus next week. Maybe that one by December. Anne knocks her chin toward the yellow bus waiting in the rain. A couple years in a yellow school and then it'll be burger flipping time for Jules. Anne, honestly. Another shrug. My older daughter is the queen of all things shrug these days. Someone has to do it. At least until they finish automating all that shit. Which is very true. But it, I guess it won't be long. I mean, we already do have robots flipping burgers. And here we learn a little bit more about her and her relationship with her husband. Uh, husband Malcolm. Most of what I've told Malcolm for the last few years has been a lie, starting with the daily I love you's and ending with whispered words on the rare occasions we have sex, always with a condom from the stash he keeps in his bedside table, always with a slathering of spermicidal jelly to ensure we won't be making any more little ones. I haven't lied to Freddy though, I know she'll do fine. After all, it's supposed to be in her genes. The prenatal Q report I showed Malcolm confirmed that nine years ago. But that was another lie. I never went in for the test. So she faked her ch uh, unborn daughter's Q results. And uh, yeah, so we get kind of some gossip here from uh, what they hear at the testing site. So uh, the chatter at the testing site. If they tell me its Q is one hundredth of a point lower than 9.5, I'm getting rid of it, said a pale woman behind her mask of painstakingly applied cosmetics, just like I did the last time. Thank God it's so quick now, said the 20-something next to her. Wouldn't it be great if manicures were that fast? They both laughed. Wow. So again, this is just interesting for those of us who are, you know, I guess threatened by autonomy. All this automation makes me wonder where they'll put the yellow school kids in another few years when the last of the grocery stores switch to self-checkout and the little Amazon delivery drones buzz up to front doors, plopping their parcels on the porches. Click, buzz, plop. It's supposed to be progress and I guess we'll be seeing more of it. Who knows? Before I retire, they might even automate teaching. And here we get, I guess, an update on how she feels about the relationship she's in. So what does Malcolm do? He shrugs, that's it. Shoulders up, shoulders down. And he pinches another piece of eggplant with his chopsticks. I used to love the man sitting across from me. I loved his wit and his smarts and his I'll always take care of you attitude. And I looked up to him. I traded something for this man. Something I thought I wanted and still do. In hindsight, it was a shitty trade. End of chapter. So we got a really deep line here, which I like as well. But we start out with this funny one, so... I want to say a million words, all beginning with F and ending with UK. Impossible, said Malcolm. P 
possibilities are only measurable before an outcome, I think, which is true. And she's reflecting upon the past and the Fitter Family campaign which brought this all about. And she get, she goes, The Fitter Family campaign created obstacles I never saw coming, which is a testament to my own optimism or stupidity. Who knows? Maybe optimism and stupidity are siblings. I don't know why I said it like that. And we hear about a woman called uh, Moira who goes to court to try and get uh, custody as a single mother. One parent is as good as two. The Fitter Family campaign disagreed. Moira went to court not at once but three times. She ended up representing herself because no lawyer would take her case, not as a single mother. She lost before the hearing even started. They told me you have to get the fitter parent to testify, she said after the third day in court. Can you believe that? The fitter parent, meaning the one who earns more, the one who takes less annual leave, the one with a higher Q rating. I can't even find my ex-husband, let alone get him to show up before a judge. Fucking laws. I felt for Moira then. I feel for her more now as I realise that Malcolm, with double the income I bring in and half the late days, will always be the fitter parent. Most men are, even the ones who aren't. So we get a reference to the Beatles, which has a Beatles fan I enjoy. Um, so her, her daughter asks her if she can uh, take a shower in the bathroom and sing something. Under the hot water, wet brush working through hair that's become long enough to start being annoying. I sing a medley of Beatles tunes. Mostly their old stuff, before dope and mysticism turn the fad four into the just plain fucking weird four. I know it all by heart and the words come out automatically, which is good because while I'm soothing Freddy, I'm also planning what I'll tell my parents when we get there. And uh, we get a reference to the boiling a frog in water thing and uh, kind of compared to the situation. Um, you know the old story about boiling the frog? If you put the frog in a pot of boiling water, he'll jump out. If, on the other hand, you put the frog in a pot of cold water and turn up the heat one degree at a time, well, before long you'll have a boiled frog and he'll never know what's coming. Our parents saw the frog boil in Germany, one degree at a time. And we learn that Freddy's on SSRIs, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like antidepressants, basically. Uh, it's because she's anxious rather than anything else, though. So. Here we learn about how uh, how we per you know perceive time. They say time is constant, steady, always moving at the same pace, but that's a bold lie. Any child knows time slows down in the days before Christmas. Any bride knows time speeds up during a wedding reception. And any mother knows time flies in the years after she gives birth. And we learn... Um, well, this is Omar, so this is our main character's grandmother. Um, just talking a little bit about their history. There were sick people in that place. For the most part, the men and women who worked there, also the men and women who helped them, Magnus and Mengele, that's um, the Nazi doctor of death. That American, Charles Davenport, it has always seemed strange to me that a man named Eugen, she pronounces this Eugen, would be the director of such an institute. So now you know, Gerhard. She shrugs slightly when she addresses my father. Dad shakes his head again. What do I know? Omar, who has been sitting listlessly on the sofa, straightens and leans forward. That your great-great-uncle was one of the men behind the extermination of millions of humans. His name was Eugen Fisher. Yes, you were wondering now why I kept that name. And that is another story for another time. I must go to bed now. And we get, before Omar closes her bedroom door, I say, It wouldn't happen here, Omar. This is the United States. Oh, my darling girl, she says, sighing. Where do you think my great-uncle Eugen got the idea? So our plot moves on and basically her daughter gets sent to one of the state schools and she follows her. She finds a way to follow her and to teach there. And while she's there we get, um, there's no chatter, no whispered schoolgirl crushes or boyish jokes. Only silence as the two rows of children assemble into two gender separated lines. I wonder for a moment what Mrs. Underwood does with the trans kids, the intersexuals, the ones who don't fit into convenient he or she moulds. Probably nothing. I don't think that's likely. I think she does horrible things to them personally. But... And she wonders whether we're born with bigotry in our blood or if hatred of the strange has to be taught. And they have a kind of a little debate about that. Again, another one of the characters, uh, his ringtone. She recognises from Apocalypse Now. Of course, he would have his ringtone set to Wagner. Another Nazi uh, symbol. I don't know if what Wagner himself was a Nazi, but the Nazis certainly adopted Wagner as an example of the master race. And here she's thinking about her age, which is interesting because I'm not far off behind this age here, so... 40 is a strange age, a milestone, a time to sit down and think about life. Growing older never bothered me, and I always thought the few wisps of grey at my temples lent a scholarly sort of air. I dyed them, of course, at Malcolm's suggestion. It would take years off your life, he said, about a thousand times. I still run and do the weights routine at my gym. I haven't yet acquired that dreaded middle-aged band of fat around my waist, and whatever skincare non-regimen I've been on for the past decade seems to be working. A 40 hit me hard. So, I mean, I'm 34, and I've only recently started exercising regularly at the gym. 
And then she's thinking about the menopause and she goes, she goes, I am menstruating, but one day I know I won't be. I won't bleed to the tune of a clock anymore. We tell our girls when they start their periods that they're women. We say trite things like, you're a woman now. Does the converse also hold? At the other end, when nature stops us, do we become unwomen? Do we dry up when we cease being capable of breeding? All right, and I just want to end by reading you the first page here of the author's notes because there are some interesting points here. Uh, I think it's cool as well, the, the way she kind of approach writing this book is similar to how Margaret Atwood approached The Handmaid's Tale. She says, this book is a work of fiction. The characters are wholly a product of my imagination. The historical events mentioned in the preceding pages, however, are very real. I haven't sat in a history class for several decades, but I remember the material. I can tell you about who invented barbed wire and the cotton gin, the assassination that catalyzed World War I, and the details of the first televised presidential debate. None of my textbooks included a word on the American eugenics movement, on the practice of forcibly sterilizing men and women, or on the harsh realities of state institutions for the so-called feeble-minded, many of whose inmates were children. If the references in this novel disturb you, then I've done my job, because these events are disturbing. For a deeper understanding of how we, as a nation, came to sanction the labelling and mistreatment of tens of thousands of individuals, I encourage you to look at various eugenics archives, which are widely available on the internet. For an enlightening account of the state school system, I highly recommend Michael D'Antonio's excellent The State Boys' Rebellion. Patriotism does not require turning a blind eye to the darker chapters of our country's history, if anything, the opposite. So... Christina Doucher, Q. Very powerful novel, as I just mentioned there. It's kind of reminiscent of The Handmaid's Tale, but Doucher has her own style as well. Um, you know, she's not just a Margaret Atwood knockoff. She's kind of made a career of writing these thought-provoking, disturbing books, and fair play to her. I can't get enough of them. I'm actually now looking forward to reading some more of her work as well. I gave Q by Christina Doucher a 4.5 out of 5. Expect to see it on my top 10 of the quarter, because it's going to take some beating. So there we have it, that's what I made of Q by Christina Doucher. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.